Well, thank you, Beck, and thank you, everyone, for coming. What do dignity and equity have to do with online engagement? And, well, before we get on to the Slido poll, the key concepts from this question come from Martha Nussbaum. So if anybody is familiar with her work, you might recognize particularly dignity. In her work, she actually used the term equality more than equity, um, but actually the way she used it reflects the way we talk about equity today. So um, I've taken the liberty of combining those two terms and it's an exploratory session. I'm seeing this as kind of a laboratory where I can put some ideas out there to all of you guys and um, and see where this leads to. So the first thing I'd like to do is a poll, if it allows me to move on. Um, I have three questions for you, and they're all in a Slido um, poll. And the first question, I think, should be quite easy because it's something we talk about quite often. So if you can join the Slido and just type in your thoughts on what does equity mean to you? And I'll give you a minute or so to do that. Okay, I'll stop it there because I think we're getting quite a few, um, quite a lot of overlap coming in from what you're saying. So I'm not seeing any contradictions. I'm seeing that people are saying everyone getting what they need and then a little bit more granular than that, things like various supports in place to ensure that everyone has a chance to be included fully, fairness dependent on needs, not wants, access and opportunities that serve the needs and goals of a group with whom you're interacting, people having access to the resources they need to achieve their goals, um, and inherent in the concept of equity is the notion that different individuals are likely to have different requirements in order to achieve the same end. Um, and so it's not enough simply to give people access to the same resources and say, well, we've achieved equality. In that case, you've achieved equality of resources, but not actually equity. So I'm going to move on to the next question now, which um, is one we talk about a little less often in higher education. Uh, so I'm curious to see, and honestly, everything, there's no right answer here, whatever you think is the right answer. So what does dignity mean to you? Right, I'll stop that one there as well. Um, thank you for all the responses. So we're getting a lot of mentions of respect. Um, we've got recognition and being valued, empowerment to choose whatever path is right for me or my family or community, welcoming the humanness of all, being treated with respect without having to ask or complain. Um, again, all aspects of our humanness are seen, respected and valued. Um, dignity means respect again. It is treating others and being treated with respectful intentions and tones, working towards a shared understanding of what is respect in our learning space, being included in ways that do not reveal whatever barriers I might be facing. Respect for human person demonstrated an ethos of care, feeling and being respected in the ways that are valid for the individual and agency and choice. Um, so I think those are, there's a lot of overlap there. There's a lot of emphasis on the human aspect of dignity. And when we come on to Martha Nussbaum's work in a bit, um, some of you might be interested to know about her, that she's recently done some work on um, the dignity of other species um, of animals that have that are sentient beings, in other words, that feel um, pain and and enjoyment or happiness, you know, positive feelings. Um, but respect is obviously at the core of it here. When you look up the dictionary definitions of dignity, um, sometimes you get things like self-respect and you get things like um, sort of genteelness or, or um, 
uh, sort of breeding decorum. So it covers quite a wide range of concepts. Um, so I'm going to move on in a bit to talking about the specific way in which Martha Nussbaum uses the term. And now this is the last poll and perhaps um, the most challenging, and it is in your mind, again, there are no right answers, but what do you see as the relationship between equity and dignity? Okay, I'll start um, wrapping this one up as well. I see two people are still typing, so. Okay, so what we've got here is too often people's needs are not met or are only met once they have complained about it. So that's bringing together the needs that we talked about in equity and the recognition of um, our humanness in, in dignity, I think, in those two different definitions. Um, we've got honoring human needs with intentionally equitable hospitality and relationality. I'm loving this terminology here. Um, Hospitality and relationality. Think of that when we come back to um, online engagement, which is what I'm going to be talking about next. Uh, treating others with dignity allows for understanding their needs to ensure equity, fulfilling individual needs for both equity and dignity within a group by ensuring you know what they are. Yeah, because we can make assumptions, right? If I honor the dignity of others, equity is wrapped up in it. They are interconnected. There must be equity for there to be dignity, and dignity can be an outcome of equity. Both involve respect for self and others. So thank you for all those um, responses. I think they've set the scene very well for um, what I'm going to be talking about next. So I'm going to move on to um, a very brief overview of the capabilities approach, which some of you might already be familiar with. Um, it's a social justice conceptual framework that originally came out of economics and philosophy um, and has been applied in very established ways to higher education. So starting with the, the root, the source of the capabilities approach, this is Amartya Sen, who I think it was in 1979 first used the term capabilities approach. Well, he took, he used it in the singular and he said capability approach. He's still writing about it, by the way. He's well into his 90s now. Um, but his definition of capabilities is that capabilities are the freedom to do and be what one has reason to value doing and being, which sounds a bit abstract. So we're going to break this down a little bit. So um, when you dig further into the literature on the capabilities, it includes two things. So typically, when you think, is someone capable of doing something, you think, do they have the skill? Do they have the ability to do that thing? Have they? Is it something that can be learned or practiced? Uh, so I've got the picture of the person on the skateboard to kind of, um, you know, cement that idea. Uh, but they also, and this is what Amartya Sen was really going for, they include freedoms that are socially or environmentally shaped. Now, what you're seeing in the picture on the right here is a group of um, women, Saudi Arabian women, in Saudi Arabia on bicycles, uh, meeting up for a bicycle ride, right? So the question is, do these women have the capability to ride bicycles? Well, they all look pretty confident and, you know, they look like they're not going to wobble or fall off their bikes or anything. So you could probably say, yes, they have the skill and ability to do so. But do they have the social and political freedom to ride those bicycles? Well, I don't know the answer to that question today in 2023. I tried to find it online and um, I couldn't find an up-to-date source. But I did find where I found this picture was a 2017 article which said that um, that women in Saudi Arabia are only allowed to ride in groups and only on beaches and in parks and only with the permission of their male guardian, who may be a husband, father, older brother or somebody appointed as their guardian. 
So do women in Saudi Arabia, or did they in 2017, have the capability to ride a bicycle? Not completely. So I think you get the idea from this that um, capabilities have a, a strong aspect of equity in them, right? Because um, this is discrimination against a whole group of people based on um, based on their gender in this case. So um, moving on now to look at how Math and Nussbaum took the concept of capabilities. Amartya Sen kept it at rather an abstract level and he didn't specify what the capabilities were that people really needed um, to live a decent life. But Nussbaum did, and she came up with this list of 10, um, and they are capabilities for political participation really more than anything else. So there's a bit of a jump we need to make to bring these into higher education. Um, and they were life, bodily health, bodily integrity, senses, imagination and thought, emotions, practical reason, affiliation, other species, play and control over one's environment. Now, I'm not going to go into what each of these means. Each of them had a fairly lengthy definition. If you just um, go into Wikipedia and uh, go into the capabilities approach, you'll find these and you'll find each of their definitions. But many of them were taken over into higher education by um, Melanie Walker, and we're going to look at that next. I just want to um, first explain a, quite a key concept in Martha Nussbaum's understanding of capabilities. And that is the difference between what she calls internal capabilities and combined capabilities. And that is what I explained earlier, the, the idea that there's a skill or ability that you can learn or, or um, it's not necessarily innate to an individual, but you can develop it. Um, and she calls those internal capabilities. So, and those tend to be, when you look at the way we teach in throughout the education system, including in higher education, we tend to focus because it's kind of, um, maybe it's easier to focus on the internal capabilities because we think those are the things that can be developed. Um, and it's our job as educators to develop those skills and abilities. Um, and yet, if our students don't have the other half of those um, capabilities, which Martha Nussbaum referred to as combined capabilities, the socially and environmentally shaped part of the capabilities, they don't have the full capabilities to do those things, right? And back to Nussbaum and her philosophy of dignity, what she said was, if people don't have the ability to develop internal capabilities into combined capabilities because of external circumstances that are outside of their control, then their dignity is being, they are not living a life worthy of human dignity, is the way she explained it. So in a sense, all 10 of Nussbaum's um, capabilities are her definition of dignity. So people, for me, I, miss, I see them as prerequisites for dignity. For Nussbaum, she says, these things together make up human dignity. So she had this idea that um, democratic states should provide this. She talked about citizens, but I think she meant the term more widely to include people under the care of governments, whether they were a citizen or not. That to enable people to live lives worthy of dignity, governments must provide at least a threshold level of the core capabilities. And she argued that every government should, as part of its democratic duties, determine what that threshold level is. And it will be different in every, um, in every country because of the resources available and so on. So I'm quickly going to... Um, whiz you through Melanie Walker's capabilities for participating in higher education, which are very much drawn from um, Martha Nussbaum's practical reasoning, which is the ability to make well-reasoned 
informed, critical, independent, intellectually acute, socially responsible and reflective choices. I've called that agency in my model and there's a precedent for that in the literature. Uh, she came up with a concept of educational resilience, um, which is the ability to navigate study, work and life, to negotiate risk and to persevere academically. Um, which wasn't obviously on Nussbaum's list, but this was Walker's um, way of making the list specific to higher education. Knowledge and imagination came um, directly from Nussbaum's original list, and it's all the things we think about critical thinking and so on. She added learning disposition, which is the ability to have curiosity and a desire for learning. She called um, what Nussbaum called affiliation, she called it social relations and social networks. It's what we think of as social learning, participating with others, peer learning and so on. Um, and then she had one called respect, dignity and recognition, um, which has dignity in the title. She had emotional integrity and emotions, which again came from Nussbaum, and bodily integrity, which is basic safety. Um, how am I doing, Beck? I see you've put your camera on. So, about twenty minutes at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Dad. Okay, I'll just wrap up then. Uh, I was going to go into detail on <laughs> on all four of the dimensions of online engagement, but it's too much for one session. So I'll just wrap up with this model, which is um, what I developed based on um, Martha Nussbaum's capabilities list, which you see along the left hand side and walker's list um and i combined some i combined bits of both of them but some of nosbaum's original wording was really useful so um the model on the right has four dimensions to it and they're the four typically um mentioned dimensions in engagement learning engagement so there's behavioral engagement cognitive engagement social and collaborative engagement and emotional engagement and I map these engagement dimensions against the capabilities from Nussbaum and the way they were framed and phrased by Walker. Uh, and they mapped on quite uh, nicely, actually. So under behavioral engagement, it is underpinned by what Walker called the capability for educational resilience. Um, cognitive engagement is underpinned by the capability for knowledge and imagination. Social and collaborative engagement is underpinned by the capability for affiliation and recognition, and emotional engagement is underpinned by the capability for emotional health. So each of these um, each of these dimensions of engagement has its own underpinning engagement uh, capability. And this is just an example of the capability for emotional health has aspects like not being subject to anxiety or fear, which diminishes learning. This is the, this has to fall into the side of learning that is a combined capability because it requires the society to have, um, to treat you in a certain way, and that can be beyond your control. Behavioral engagement is all about negotiating risk, being responsive to circumstances, again, that are often outside of your control. Cognitive engagement, we don't always think of it in this way, but it's not just about thinking critically, it's, but it's about being able to be an active inquirer without fear of reprisal or censorship. And my research was amongst refugees and asylum seekers for whom this was a very real anxiety. And finally, social and collaborative engagement is not just about being nice to other people in groups and learning together, but it's about being treated with dignity and entering into relationships of mutual respect, recognition and trust. So these are the four areas I came up with for um, learning design implications. And um, I won't go into those now, but my my suggestion is that in order for, for the learning design implications are basically about treating people with dignity and it can work both ways. If you focus on how do we treat our students with dignity as best we possibly can, you'll be fostering online engagement. If you focus on what are the things we need to do to foster online engagement, you will be supporting people's dignity. Um, 
and equity. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I see some threads that connect your research with the research that I did. Um, and I think there, there's, you know, ne you say next steps to research always. It's, I think capabilities approaches, and I'm, I'm doing a little bit of research now on thresholds and that whole notion of a threshold concept as well that um, I think has something to be it's something that we can link into open educational practices. So let me just get started. Um, I am sharing, for those of you that are aware, I will be defending my PhD um, dissertation next week. And this is a almost like a practice run um to share the research that i have conducted over the the uh, previous number of years so i appreciate your presence here today as i share this research titled media and digital literacies and this is a post-intentional phenomenology which may be a new methodology for some people and i hope this presentation will enlighten and and entertain um I acknowledge the support of the GOGN leadership and the network throughout this PhD work that I've done. Specific thanks to Dr. Martin Weller, Beck Pitt, Rob Farrow, Paco, and Karina. Here in Canada, we acknowledge the history and legacy of Indigenous peoples and recognize um, and I recognize the, the history and legacy of Indigenous peoples who have lived on the lands for thousands of years. It's my privilege to conduct my PhD journey and research on the traditional lands of the Three Fires Confederacy here in Ontario and reflect deeply on what it means to be an educator and a settler. Oh, let's keep going. Um, the presentation outline, I'll share my positionality as a researcher, uh, outline the research question that uh, has driven my research, the frame the theoretical and conceptual literature, um, share the research design and findings, and crystallize some of the discussion points from the dissertation, and delineate contributions that this research makes to the field of education. I am a teacher educator by trade. I'm a lifelong educator and learner. I explore educational technology in a global sandbox thanks to uh, virtually connecting and um, some of the um, hybrid pe pedagogy work that I was involved in early on. I'm a maker in digital education spaces as a teacher and a learning designer. I intersect K-12 education, higher education, and open educational spaces, and I'm a catalyst and reflector in writing, presenting, and engaging with others through published papers, chapters, open blogging, media productions, and through this PhD process, I've, I am becoming a researcher. So Parker Palmer posited that we teach from an internal as much as an external position. So research like teaching comes from within myself as much as it comes from the outside world. And I uh, research openly present in a community uh, such as GoGN and um, uh, shifting across time zones and within different technologies as I meet and negotiate through conversations about teacher education and open educational practices. I share openly because I believe, firmly believe, as outlined in documents by the United Nations and UNESCO, that education offers the greatest common good and that educators, such as ourselves in this room, at their core are gifts that keep giving. So as I began the process, I examined the flows of information reflected on my positionality, and I heeded the words of Dr. Susan Dion, who's an Indigenous scholar here in, in Ontario, who keynoted during my doctoral studies part one, and she advocated for researchers to dig where you stand. So the research question emerged from my positionality as I asked, what lived experiences with media and digital literacies are evident in open educational practices of teacher educators? And of course, had to pick Canadian faculties of education to frame the research, um, kind of bounding it geographically. So I aim to bring understanding to media and digital literacies 
in practice from a socio-constructivist epistemology. I was compelled by Marshall McLuhan's prophetic phrase to create the dissertation in an alternative media and digital format. So I strategically selected Scalar software to present the, um, the, the digital format. And I applied a Creative Commons license to my dissertation manuscript. So I was influenced by alternative publications such as Serafini's, uh, Seraf uh, Serafini's Codex Serafinianus, and of course, Nick Susanus's dissertation manuscript, Unflattening. So since understanding terminology is critical, I offered a clarification for the word practice. So we, it, this, this is, I guess, what is an important um, consideration since I was researching the practices of practicing in a teacher educator's teaching practice. So confusion can and does emerge from this polysemous term. It holds multiple meanings as both a noun, the thing we call a practice, and the verb, the actions we undertake as we practice. And complications occur, often occur when the thing is confused with the doing. So I used sketch notes and concept mapping to make sense of the research literature and the results. So I'm aware that by offering these sketch notes as part of this presentation may push and stretch your cognitive load. Um, doesn't always model best practice in, in teaching and learning with multimedia. Yet I offer these images um, as media teasers to entice you to explore further in the web publications of my dissertation. I stand bridging mighty rivers of research. An abundant, there's an abundance of information um, in the confluence of three fields of study that I honor and recognize all the voices and people who have contributed to this flow. First is the field of teaching and teacher education with a specific focus on the teacher educators, not the students or the content or subject matter. Second is the field of literacies in education, specifically with a focus on media and digital literacies. And third is the field of open education with focus on specifically open educational practices. And for each of these, I needed to forward upstream to, to narrow the focus. And additionally, I also needed to examine qualitative research methodologies, which led to my selection of post-intentional phenomenology and crystallization. I examined research in education specifically focusing on teaching practice and what it means to teach. And I've just um, added a collection of some of the, the books that I've, I've read through and um, researchers that I've I've worked, you know, tried to figure out what was what was going on, but I kept a focus specifically on areas that tied to technologies, media, digital elements, where they applied to teacher educators. For research into open education, I went through and eliminated papers that um, focused on on the open education movement or the production and application of open educational resources, or even that focused on pedagogies. And I was looking specifically for um, Canadian contexts that focused on open educational practices. And as I narrowed down my examination of research into open educational practices, I looked for connections specifically again to media and digital literacies and realized that it was more than just the pedagogical considerations or the technological competence or the subject matter expertise of the individuals based on the research, teaching and learning within an open educational practice appeared as negotiated, uh, relational, communal, critical and decisional. So for research into literacies, particularly in education, I struggled through definitional issues starting from um, um, uh, Doug Belshaw's work, uh, where he opened up a Pandora's box of literacies in teaching and learning. So there were many ephemeral literacies that emerged as I read through the literature. Um, and I had to gain an understanding of the differences between literacies as a cognitive ability. I, uh, I think therefore I can do this literacy versus uh, literacy as a social practice. And then I became mired in the distinctions between 
literacies in education and literacy education, which are two different things as well. But examining research into literacies then led me to discern these, these discrepancies in understanding between conceptions of skills, fluencies, competencies, thanks, thank you to Gabby, and literacies. And the challenge was in realizing how much of the research that was attempting to talk about literacies were really talking about skills, fluencies, and competencies. So this led to the, this graphic um, uh, that I, I created in order to try and, and structure my thinking around how this spirals together. So skills lead to fluencies, to competencies, potentially to literacies, and having some discussions now around, well, is, is competencies at the top of that spiral and literacies um, lead in from so crystallization methodology caught my attention as soon as I read Laura Richardson's work, um, and that led me to Laura Allingson's work, who spotlighted the facets of crystallization methodology, and she described it as integrated, dendritic, open, iterative, flexible, and complex, and despite the drawbacks that she identified, I knew that this methodology fit this research focus. What was more challenging for me was selecting post-intentional phenomenology as a philosophical and the methodological foundation for my research. And it, it was initially examining digital ethnography, phenomenography, um, and narrative inquiry as possible approaches. But it was when I uh, came across uh, Canadian phenomenologists, Max Van Manen and Sam Roca uh, uh, from UBC, that my direction was set. So I was able to distinguish between transcendental, interpretive, and post-intentional approaches to conducting phenomenological research, and how each approach frames perceptions of intentionality and life worlds. And it wasn't until I had a handle on the phenomenon of phenomenology that I knew my research was post-intentional in nature and uh, uh, read a, a substantial amount of, of research from Mark, Mark Vogley out of the US on read, researching and writing ab um, about post-intentional phenomenology. So I'll just move on to the research design decisions and briefly touch on the findings from the multiple layers of data gathering that I uh, conducted. So I did purposefully, purposefully sampled um, teacher educators across uh, Canadian faculties of education who met uh, a set of established criteria. And 14 agreed to engage in the research, first a 60 minute interview, and then um, they produced a reflective digital artifact. And as part of my research methods, I ensured confidentiality of their participation, since these are all well-known open educators in Canadian contexts. Um, I randomized their avatars, images, and um, their names are garnered from star charts. So once the interview was scheduled, I gathered and analyzed digital information from sources like their social media activities, websites, blog posts, course syllabi, and their curriculum vitae. And during the 60 minute uh, semi-structured conversational interviews, I talked to each one about their lived experiences with open educational practice and how the, these lived experiences demonstrated or modeled media and digital literacies in that practice. So the phase, the research phases, I managed, while I was conducting interviews, I was also completing the coding of interviews. I was searching for evidence for upcoming interviews and then also recording my reflective research notes. And at the end of that interviewing phase, I took a few months um, to organize the data and make sense of the materials I had gathered. And from the in vivo coding, I mapped out some preliminary findings and shared them back to the participants for critical feedback. And then I stepped away from the preliminary results just to spend some time to investigate research literature into analysis since I saw that this was a gap in my skills as a researcher. So based on the insights that I gained from reading Sildana, uh, Braun and Clark, I refocused on the stories related by the, uh, by the participants. And this led to the creation of the concept map, which I'll briefly explore 
Um, so under the open educational practices, the participants mentioned access, choice, and connections. And from the findings from media and digital literacies emerged uh, stories about communication, creativity, and criticality. And just to note that some, most of this was being conducted during um, some of the shutdown periods of the pandemic, as well as some of the periods just as we were emerging out of the pandemic. So access related to entry points and gateways, as well as intentionality in sharing as an access consideration for themselves and their students. So issues of access also emerged when using languages other than English. In, in our case, it's uh, French and English, but uh, other languages also emerged, uh, particularly with Indigenous languages. And Polaris's comment is representative of something that it that was an entry point, um, making things visible, not beyond behind uh, paywalls, for example. Choice was related in how and why they shared, as seen in Rigel's comment. And choice was mentioned in the openness of how they design teaching materials and choices relating to agency and ownership in selecting technology not only for them, themselves, but for their students' use. So thinking in terms of openness or, or protection, um, closed um, choices. Connections in their stories related to building relationships with students, particularly with insights gained through that the COVID teaching experiences they had and how to build relationships within um, open and closed spaces opening up collaborations for both research projects and with students. And several of them talked about building connections to others in their fields of study, not only for themselves, but for their students. And that's exemplified by Akila's comment here. In the areas of communication, participants mentioned intended audiences and ethical practices when communicating, as evident in this comment by Vega. And communication was also mentioned as a data management issue when sharing student learning or applying technologies with, with an, a, a vision of, of open, openly sharing. As represented by this comment by Izar, creativity was mentioned by every participant and connected to multimodal productions and performances for themselves and for their students, uh, creating videos, for example, with... Um, um, immigrant women who, who had just immigrated into Canadian contexts. And with evidence in their stories and experiences that were definitely influenced by COVID restrictions and their, their um, technical technological expertise or lack thereof. As suggested in this comment by Perseus, the lived experiences of the teacher educators included considerations of themselves and their students as receptors and emitters um, compared to rather than prosumers, which is a, a very um, um, bounded co uh, context in terms of, of payment, emitting and receiving information is, is they are doing that as, as they construct their professional identity. We're teaching people who will become teachers who are creating their professional identity as they're going through the faculty and then circulating. How do they circulate that, that work into open digital spaces? So then from these shared stories, I crystallized the findings with a vision on how these 14 educators, teacher educators managed to keep their eye on that, that unknown horizon when integrating media and digital literacies into their open educational practice. So I gravitated to a navigational gyroscope as a metaphor, imagining these teacher educators standing on this spinning platform, um, the, the rotor, grounding their teaching practice while applying the skills, fluencies, and competencies. And then this platform is surrounded by rotating gimbals that outline media and digital literacies, as well as elements of their open educational practices. And then along those sliders that shift and move are, are these, um, again, these factors that, that impact media and digital literacies in open educational practices. And then this whole mechanism is spinning within contextual and cultural environments, depending on where they're teaching. 
So I, I say it's reminiscent of this arrow trim device that I've seen on videos where people are spinning in this, this device and never quite knowing which, which way is up. So once I crystallized these stories um, and these facets of, of media and digital literacies in open educational practices, I uh, analyzed them and went back to the research and I, I looked for um, frameworks that would help me frame the findings. And I found seven media and digital literacy frameworks um, that I compared and contrasted to the findings. And when, when I did this, I discovered that there were four dimensions that consistently were present in the frameworks and in the findings. So these were um, the, key, the key elements were communication, creativity, connecting, and criticality. And these were, I framed them within the um, Association for Media Literacy Media Triangle, uh, text, audience, and production within context, culture, and history. So under communication dim dimension, I found my attention, uh, focused my attention on the premise that communication is considered a human right for a common good, and that humans are storytellers, and teachers are some of the best storytellers. For creativity dimension, my focus crystallized around remix, using and, and remixing content for teaching purposes and problem solving uh, as creative acts. Under the dimension relating to connections, I focused on the connectedness of community, particularly with focus on equity, care, and social justice, uh, Sarah Lambert's work, for example. And dimensions relating to criticality emerged when making decisions around the tools, technologies, spaces, and places that uh, the, the critical criticality dimension also examined how media and digital literacies contribute to breaking or establishing boundaries within an open educational practice, and both are important. And uh, the final piece was the criticality that is emerging in the areas of datification, artificial intelligence, even more so since I, I finished the, the research um, with ChatGBT, for example, and some conversations that happened at OE Global around blockchain in education, which will be, I think, something that, that um, open educators and media digital literate educators will need to, fa to face. So my stated aim was to add to the corpus of research focused on the lived experiences of teacher educators, um, understanding media and digital literacies within an open educational practice. So with it, this in mind, I offer four contributions that emerge from this research. First, I added an R. And this small change in common nomenclature for open educational practice may contribute to the clarification of the concepts, since I distinguish clear distinctions between pedagogies and practices. I clarify the spirals um, evident between skills, fluencies, competencies, and literacies, particularly as they apply specifically to media and digital teaching and learning. I highlight the complexity of teacher educators' navigations in media and digital literacies within an open educational practice. So without some form of navigation system and understanding, it's as challenging as piloting a spacecraft or possibly more difficult, I would propose, than rocket science. And I contribute an alternative dissertation format in the Scalar publication that it can be a model for graduate studies in educational research. And I conclude by extending my thanks for your attention, and I welcome any feedback. So the contact information and the Scalar presentation links are available, and you can take a look.